Lift the barrel, aim, and shoot. Wait. Wait. You seem well rested after your nap this afternoon. Does that always help? Help what? Your memory. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You asked me to come get you. You said you couldn't handle the farm anymore. I would never say that. You did, Dad. <clears throat> what kind of doctor is your boyfriend? He's my husband. He's not a doctor, he's a nurse. You know that. Look. Heard you went swimming, Daddy. First time in the Pacific Ocean? I know what you're up to. You want to take advantage because you think I've lost my marbles. <gasps> Who do you think paid for this house Are anyway? Are you finished? Your mother warned me last night. Dad, you know Mom's not here. What's the matter? They take away your wings? When they found out you weren't quite the manly man they thought they hired, now you're just another housewife. You think you can do and say whatever you want? You know where the door is, my friend. <laughs> hear that? Mm-hmm. Two hearts. and doesn't want him, and hell keeps sending him back. Well, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special episode of Torn Tuesday, right here on the OneRing.net. As always, the ultimate destination for J.R.R. Tolkien fans on the interwebs. We've been here for over 20 years doing our live stream for uh, almost eight years now. My goodness, I lose track of time. And we have a very special guest who is uh, probably, you know, this is the point where I should do like David Letterman and say, you know, my guest requires no introduction at all. <laughs> uh, before we go further. Henry um, Mortensen. There he is, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we are we are joined by Henry Mortensen and Vigo Mortensen, familiar to all of you out there in the world of Tolkien fandom. And I'm thrilled to have you both, gentlemen. Thank you for being here to talk about your new film, your new directing debut, Falling, and all the other crazy things under the sun that uh, Lord of the Rings fans want to talk with you about. Welcome aboard, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, great to be here. Um, mm. Yeah, I remember. Nice to see you again. I remember uh, checking even when those the films were before they, any of them had come out. I remember you, Dad, and, and other people going on the One Ring dot net to just to see what people were talking about and to see what sort of like mm. theories and stuff were going on. Just out of curiosity, I remember people. Even yeah, in like ninety nine, two thousand, checking. Yeah, how, was like how people, going. what people were imagining the adaptation would be like, and then as the movie started, the first one came out. How did fe people feel about it? Was the spirit of Tolkien captured? And, and mm. a lot of knowledgeable, a lot of knowledgeable people contributing it. Even back then, readers of Tolkien's books, you know, experts, novices, all kinds of people interacting and cross-referencing, you know, the Silmarillion and other, other works. And it was very, it was fascinating. It is. To uh, check in there once in a while. See what was going and on. we have, uh, we have canine experts who are ready to join our panel, our special panel today as well. <laughs> That's Nina, wonderful. She's, a, she's a, an expert on, on she's an expert uh, speaker of Sindarin, as you can hear. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Um, a bit high pitched right nope. now, but that's a, uh, it's very, that's old school Sindarin. Right <laughs> that's old school Agitated Sindarin. old school Sindarin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Okay. First of all, um, I just got to say, from all of the fans, Henry, number one 
comment or question from our worldwide Tolkien audience. The fans say specifically to you, Henry, thank you, because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here all today. Everyone just says thank you very much. Um, there is well, you a would point. Be. I, I wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> and Henry probably would be. <laughs> That's too funny. I would, I would be dwelling in ignorance. Still. <laughs> well, all right. Um, look at it. Look at it this way. Um, in so small an act, in such a, a small act, can all of destiny be changed? And that's part of the thematic power of the Lord of the Rings to a degree. And I, I love that. I love that concept. Um, but I want to talk uh, about the very first rule of Hollywood, um, where they say generally, never work with kids or animals. <laughs> and here you are, Vigo, right out of the gate, breaking all the rules with your first film. <laughs> it's wonderful, actually. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's true. There's a lot of kids in, in falling, and uh, yeah, and there are horses, and yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah, there are birds. and that poor about, duck, ducks, deer. Yeah, you thought about including a, a dog, right? At one point, but that seemed like yeah, I was gonna give, I was gonna give Willis the uh, Lance Henriksen's character. His name is Willis. He's the uh, yes the guy who plays my father. You know, my father in the story, and. Um, yeah, I was thinking he'd have a little dog because he seems to get along with animals and with nature, people mm -hmm. not so much. It's pretty misanthropic. And um, I thought a little dog could be his unconditional friend, but it just, we just didn't get around to it. It just seemed like it might complicate things a little bit. We didn't really need it. We had a short mm -hmm. shoot and we had a lot to do anyway. So indeed, it kind of had our um, fill. Well, we let's did consider it. That's that's wonderful. I, I would more the more fur friends and the more furry children around the better. That's wonderful. Um, but I want to tell the audience Mina. very quickly. Um, <laughs> the the movie that you've made. This is your she very first us. time. Oh, I hope she does. I hope I hope the dog can come and join us. Um, the uh, this is your first time directing a feature film, and um, it seems to me. Uh, because the images and the the storytelling are very powerful with me now. I've recently seen the film, and it seems to be a powerful meditation on forgiveness um, and on uh, the wounds, the family wounds that that hurt us, that follow us through our lifetimes. Um, was this part of your goal to explore the dynamics of healing between people? Yeah, to some degree, healing through communication, really. I mean, mm. I guess one of the main, <clears throat> the most important aspects, at least to me, about this story and the reason I wanted to write it in part was, first of all, to communicate with, to not forget, to keep that flame alive, to keep that wound open, um, that is the collection of memories I have, feelings, really, because I think memories are more f a collection of feelings and facts, really, uh, about my mother. That's how it mm. started, it was after her funeral. And then I was thinking about communication, I was thinking about my dad. My dad's not, wasn't really like Willis's, but you know, he was, had his moments of being inflexible, sort of a man of his generation, you know, born during the Great Depression and came of age during World War II, back then, Little boys, generally speaking, were were raised to not show, not cry, not to, you know, they, they were, you had to be tough, you had to seem like you were in control, that you knew things, you know, um, you had to grow up to be a manly man, and people mm -hmm. had, people would then, when you formed a family, they would adapt to you, you would not adapt to them, whether it was your offspring or your partner, your wife, whatever. And so he was, mm. my dad was a bit like that. But, um, and I was just thinking about that and also the, the, the issue of dementia. Dementia and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. is, you know, it's everywhere. Most families are touched with it sooner or later. And um, 
And that's something that uh, I wanted to explore and that I've had a lot of experience with, a lot of intimate experience. Here's Buddy. Mm. Buddy Morris. Buddy was, uh, was my grandpa's dog before he was, he was my dog. Oh, that's, right. that's beautiful. He away. Henry did a cross country trip in the middle of winter and drove back to um, California from the Northeast. But uh, yeah, no, I wanted to explore communication and the issue of, um, I mean, dementia was something that's, there's a lot of it mm -hmm. on both sides of our family. So it was exploring that. And that has to do with communication and memory, obviously, also difficulties at mm. that. And just generally, you know, communication, how difficult it can be at times. And I don't like stories that give you answers. I, I like questions, really. I like, um, I wanted exactly. to sort of pose the question, are there people you can't talk to? Are there people that don't deserve to be communicated with? I, I happen to not think so, but I'm not saying that. I'm just showing a situation where it's extremely difficult to communicate with somebody, to forgive, mm -hmm. to understand, all these things. And um, you can't really forgive unless you understand first. You know, you have to accept what is. Because um, mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know what you're forgiving, <laughs> really. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a story well, in which there's the, the main characters are a father and a son. And, and the son is having to be, because his father does need mental and physical help, at his, whether he wants to admit it or not. And he's probably only going to allow his son, maybe, to help him a little. And so the son realizes, okay, I'm going to have to be as stubborn about trying to communicate with him as he is stubborn about apparently not wanting to mm. communicate with me because he's irascible, he's intolerant. He's a uh, he's a tough character. He's almost yeah. a uh, almost a mirror image of my own father. I mean, it's really? it's kind of un it's uncanny. <laughs> you you made a movie about a uh, uh, a gay man at a certain age dealing with his father, who is very very much like that. And I have I have my own memories when I was a child of my dad sitting with me in a deer stand up on the top of a tree just like these characters in your film and i had to oh i had to come out of the closet and face the same wild disapproval and anger when i was just a teenager and then i had to also i mean i, I forgive me for for i don't mean to no 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 this is myself. amazing it's but you you made a film believe it or not that will directly speak speak to so many people who are struggling with that 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 balance of you know acceptance and lack of acceptance within the family um and it's it's not that my my father has ever been as as a misanthrope as willis uh but he right. he's very very much in, in you know inflexible and learning through his older years and struggling with a very bad sepsis infection that nearly took him from us last mm. year um he wow. he's learning to slowly open up this this mm. brain wave of uh, uh that he has never opened up at, at this level where old age and the benefit of wisdom has kind of changed the dynamic with my father and it's remarkable to see how your characters are also struggling with that the the fact is the family the family bond causes so much of the pain, but it also is a resource for so much of the healing that people need with each other. Exactly. And I'm completely fascinated by your film because it speaks very powerfully on that level. It really does. Well, thank you for telling me that. And I have to say that, I mean, that's the most closely healing to our story thing I've just well, I think I've ever heard, but I mean, constantly, mm. fortunately, while we were shooting the movie, the crew and the cast, it wasn't just another job, but you never know how mm. it's going to be, but it, it wasn't. It, it, everybody got personally and emotionally involved, and on a daily basis, people were sharing stories about their own families, and they weren't mm. as on the nose as yours, but sometimes they were close. There were some aspects, sometimes it was about a, a mother, a father, an aunt, uncle, grandparents, or friends they had situations it was it was great to feel that there was this connection this universal connection and that mm -hmm. i guess the reason i was trying to tell the movie 
was the reason they were telling, sharing these stories. Because you suddenly realize as a human being, wait a minute, I don't have to live in isolation. I can live alone physically, but I don't have to live in isolation with my doubts and fears. I can share them with other people. And they probably, as it turns out, have their own. And some of them are not so different and so forth. And so, and with audiences, even some uh, other journalists and stuff, you know, people have connected a lot of times. Now, some people have responded, fortunately not too many, vehemently and say, no, it's like, why would anybody put up with something like that? That is not believable or somebody treats me like oh. that, I just walk away. It's like, well, maybe you haven't had the experience yet. You know, wait, you'll see. And maybe you won't be so dismissive, you know. I mean, it's, e it's much easier to dismiss a, a movie, a story, or a person uh, to condemn it or them than it is to try to understand it. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's always true. Not that you can make a movie that's going to please everyone. I think that's a crazy goal to have anyway. You just got to tell the story you'd like to see, you know. But um, this communication thing is, it is a crucial aspect of it. And it was, an, you know, the process. I did succeed in keeping that flame alive and that wound open. You know, and wound is not necessarily negative. It's just a reminder. Uh, yes. A wound or a scar. It's like, okay, that's part of my history, you know, uh, for better mm -hmm. or for worse. And and so my mom is very much alive, but she's transformed. It's not just one thing anymore, you know, in the way that Hannah Gross plays Gwen in the movie. In the mm -hmm. stories that people have shared with me about their families, it's now a composite of feelings I have that are have branched out, have become more layered because of other people's stories about people that probably mm. didn't look like or weren't anything like my mom, but there was something in those stories that reminded me of, remind me now of my mom or my dad. You know, as my memories keep changing anyway, our memories, it's a tricky thing. We like to think that memory is, you know, the past. You know, we know what that is. I mean, the present's very confusing all the time. It's in flux. Future, we don't know what mm. the hell that is. But at least we can count on the past. You know, we got the photo albums. We got the diary entries. We got history books. We have, mm. you know, photos, videos. But photos, videos, history books, photo albums, diary entries, they're all written, shot, remembered by somebody it's got a point of view so you never can get exactly at what happened and we and mm -hmm. we think we know we, we sort of try to control our past i think subconsciously it's a constant mm, psychological process like our inner computer or whatever you call it we just do it we control it and edit it and and, and mm. those memories evolve according to our needs psychologically because we want to feel like uh, we're comfortable. We want to be comfortable in the present. That's all. Mm -hmm. And they're they're very. It's very interesting. You can just talk with someone that that about the same event that you were both at, same person, and you'll find that you have discrepancies. You know, it's like no, it wasn't daytime. It was nighttime. Yeah, no, it was summer. It wasn't when you weren't even there. You know, those kind of conversations and memory. The thing going back to what you said. The way memory is explored in this movie, uh, in a way, sometimes there are hurtful things that you remember, but whether they're very positive or very negative or somewhere in between, those subjective memories contain moments of connection sometimes. You know, where, let's say in a relationship like Willis and John in the story, or your own father and you, right? Sometimes remembering moments where, let's say, the bonds of affection weren't broken. In other words, yeah, it wasn't always like now, can help you rebuild in the present in a different way, you know what I mean? And I think in society, I mean, this movie comes out at a time when communication is at an all-time low, I think, in our society. You know, mm -hmm. there's bad communication, no communication. There's a lot of no communication whatsoever. It's like another pandemic almost, and 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 I think that as a country, and I think that's what maybe Biden and some of the others are trying to do is let's harken back to a time. Let's not try to go back there because you can't, but it's like let's remember when we could have a conversation with people that we didn't agree with at all, or we could listen exactly. to them, rather than 
It's in their own corner. And you can, you can use time. that. You can learn from the past, even if it's a subjective recollection. Well, that's one of my favorite things that you skillfully did with the way you edited the montages together in the film. There is something very meditative about the kind of memories that are at play. And there's this remarkable shuffling between one character's memory and another character's memory. And at certain points in watching Falling, I wasn't sure if I was experiencing John or if I was experiencing Willis. And then I realized, yeah. oh, sometimes it, it's both. It's actually both of their memories. And the way that your camera rests so carefully on the cobwebs over the barn door, or maybe the flowers and the way they catch the light in the sun. Mm -hmm. And those are bits of memory that crisscross in the human consciousness in strange and e ephemeral ways. I mm -hmm. loved that quality of you exploring mm -hmm. the memories with these characters. It was really, really wonderful. Um, and it's kind of, it is the tonic really that leads us to acceptance. When you start to realize mm -hmm. that you have a background of relatedness, uh, a background of relatedness with your family, which is unmatched mm -hmm. with any other people in your life, there is great mm -hmm. value in that, I think. Um, and I was really glad to see you explore that so thoroughly in your film. Mm -hmm. um, There's, does there it is seem some, to... It's true what you're saying. Sometimes it's clearly one person's point of view or the others, John or, or, the, or Willis is usually. A couple mm -hmm. times it's Laura's, and sometimes it seems like a more objective or shared one. Um, yeah. But then there are instances yeah. where there's a uh, transfer of a memory. You know, for example, the, the there's this sort of it's almost like a short story within a novel or something. The the duck story, right? What happens with the duck? <laughs> it starts exactly. out clear as a memory that an old man has in the bathroom in the lavatory on, on an airplane. And he remembers taking his four year old son duck hunting and letting him shoot just for the hell of it, not ever dreaming the kid's going to hit a duck. It starts there. And then by the time and you go through this, well, I don't want to ruin it if nobody's seen it, but there's a story that introduces the family dynamics in a way and their relationship to nature through this story of what happens with this duck. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's sort of the morning after the events happen on the, the previous evening with this duck. And this story is sort of spread out through the first third of the movie. And then there's one final piece of it that's towards the very end of the movie. Um, the next morning during this duck story where the little boy wakes up, it, sort of it becomes his memory. It's no longer, and, and now it's the son's memory, you know, but it happens visually, it's clear, oh, that's what's happening. And then even the way the music is used within the memory and sound, you know, when the father does come in, the father back then uh, enters the room as part of this duck story, the music stops. When he leaves the room, it starts again. So that part of it is between the son and it's the son's memory of this duck and of his mother. Mm. And when that father doesn't belong, it's like his memory, you know? So that's, it's, it's interesting. And then sometimes they coincide in a strange way, mm. as I think happens, you know? What were you just thinking of? Were you thinking of, and yeah, I was, how'd you know? I don't know, I just felt like that happens mm -hmm. in life, right? Mm -hmm. so, it does. Yeah. It's, I thought that was interesting too, because also I remember in, in sort of in, uh, I think you guys have talked about this, uh, maybe you and Lance, that in, in creating Willis, obviously you in writing the script took a lot from, from your own memories, but even before you started filming, there ended up being some, some stuff from Lance's life that went into Willis's yeah. character you know, about from his experience or his memories of his parents. Um, and yep. so it's kind of interesting that there's a, a parallel between what's going on in the movie and sort of that creation of that character that that's yeah. also a blend of, of both of your memories in a in way. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, and it was really, and there, and there just, there's no, there's no separation. They follow, I mean, this character that we created, there are moments, you know, Henry obviously knows, you know, his grandfather, my 
my father, as do my brothers. That's why the movie's dedicated to Charles and Walter. Um, there are certain glimpses of behavior, turn of phrase. I mean, things that Lance Henriksen couldn't have known, but the way he looks at the other characters sometimes, the tone of voice and some of the lines are completely my father. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's uncanny. And the same with Hannah Gross as Gwen, just the way she looks at it, at, at the kid, her kids sometimes, or just her attitude. So there's something, she doesn't exactly look like my mom, but she is my mom somehow in spirit. And so is Lance at times, but Lance is also very moved as he's working on this movie because he was referencing, like as Henry says, his father, his mother. And there are, I mean, he's a great storyteller, Lance is. And so in these years that were frustrating to wait for financing to come together, as Henry says, we worked a lot on the script and um, talked about stuff. And Henry, and uh, Lance told me lots of stories, and Henry's heard a lot of them too from him, um, about his childhood. Some difficult stories, but every once in a while, you know, there would be something he would say, and I'd say, I would like to use those words. I'd like to use that line if I could, if you don't, can we use it, you know, as part of your character? He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, as long as I never get caught acting, that's all I ask you to help me with. I said, well, I don't think I'll have to because you, you are, all your movies, no matter how out there the genres are or unclassifiable, brief your appearances, strange your character, even if other people around you in any of the movies you've done, hundreds of movies over the past 50 years, are not really credible somehow or just not up to snuff, you know, in some way. Um, uh, from my point of view, subjectively, as, as an audience member, of course, he's always riveting. It's not just that he has his voice, his face, his presence. Even mm. now at 80, he's just a powerhouse. It's also that he really works hard. He really prepares. He really takes it seriously, and he wants to live it every time. And that's what he wanted to do with Willis. So he threw everything there. I mean, he just went all the way. No holes barred. He was not trying to get the audience to sympathize with him. Um, he was trying just to create as real a person as possible and have the emotions be felt real. I mean, he wanted to go all the way, which is... A dream you know that's what you want as an actor that yeah he certainly director. did he, he's I, you know there was a, a question that had been submitted from um one of our staff about the preparation that you did and you just kind of answered um a lot of that already but working with lance who is such a veteran and and to bring in that level of intensity in especially in front of the smaller children you had on the set how how did you manage to get ready for some of those bigger scenes that had this explosive level of emotion? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as the kids, he got along with all of them really well. But he really did develop a, a special bond with Gabby Vellis, who plays uh, who plays Monica, our adopted daughter. Monica. They were just yeah. best pals. It was, it was wonderful, and that ref That's great. was reflected in the movie. You know, because she was not. She didn't have the baggage that John and Sarah, his kids have, and that even the teenage kids of Laura have, where they're like, well, they don't have baggage, they just don't have any problem telling him to go screw himself when he's out of line. But Monica <laughs> did not sit in judgment of him. He, she was non-judgmental. She just thought, I mean, all the things that would horrify us, maybe, <laughs> uh, some more than others, that, that came out of Lance's mouth continually during the story, out of Willis's mouth, both the character Monica, but I think also Gabby on some level, she found it like it was funny. It was wacky. It was like, oh, grandpa's fun. You know, he's like, he's not like other people. <laughs> he says the damnedest things, <laughs> you know, but she enjoyed it. And he instinctively as a character senses that this person is not judging me. This person actually likes me. There's unconditional affection. There's no conditions mm. put on her interest in me. And whereas my son may love me, but he puts conditions on it. He wants me to behave differently. Mm. And in the end, these two men are trying to fix each other. And that's, that's a mistake on both their parts. 
you know, by the end, mm -hmm. hopefully they've learned to accept what's there and maybe hope that things can change, but it's like, you got to get to know the person first and accept them on their own terms. And Monica totally accepts him from the get go on his own terms. And so they get along famously, you know, isn't um, that uncanny how children can do that? Just accept us as who we really are. That's part of the magic of that really. Um, and you feel so, grateful when someone does yeah. that for you. Yeah. <laughs> so Henry, my next question to you, Henry, did you learn something in this process of falling about taking care of your family and your father? Hmm. Perhaps. Uh, well, I mean, um, I don't know, uh, about, uh, taking care of per se. Um, like my dad was talking to him about when he started writing it, um, his dad, my grandpa was, was still around. Um, but my grandma just, uh, passed away. Both of my mom's parents, um, had already passed away, uh, as well as her stepmom. Um, and my dad's stepdad and stepmom. Um, and with all of my, my, uh, grandparents on my, my dad's side of the family, all of them had a sort of prolonged illness um, and generally some form of, of dementia that um, I didn't take, I wasn't as involved as, as my dad was, but I was there through a lot of that and saw in three different people the full progression of three different kinds of, of dementia. Um, which is you learn um, that you have to accept their reality if you want to be able to spend any quality time with them. Um, you learn that telling them, no, it's not 1967 isn't helpful for anyone besides you because um, it's just you trying to hold on to the idea that you can snap them out of it. And it's you being uncomfortable with the fact that their mind is, is, is somewhere else. Um, because for them, especially in the early stages, they are going to be in the present most of the time, but sometimes they're not. And they're going to realize and feel stupid. Um, but it's better to not make them feel more awkward about it. And then at a certain point where their brain is, where their memory takes them is just what's real for them. And if you want time with your grandparents, it's better to just be dwell in that moment. And maybe you'll learn a little extra about your, you know, like for me, my great aunts and great uncles or whatever, or my great grandparents. So they'll, you know, because That's they're really in that moment, so vividly, you might hear a side of some story you've never heard before. But you won't, if you're not open to it, if you're constantly wanting them to be something else and, and behave in a different way and quote unquote, make sense, <laughs> according to your view of the present, their present is different at a certain point. And, you know, once someone gets to that point, there, there's no sense in correcting, there's no sense in criticizing, and there's no sense in arguing. You know, it's like if there ever was, <clears throat> probably not, but you know, and so you have to sacrifice your ego, as Henry's saying, really, and serve them. I mean, you should serve all your friends, anybody you care about, on some level, you should serve them. I mean, I like you, therefore, I should be interested in what you feel and what you think. Where, mm -hmm. What do you want to talk about? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do today? You know, and that it's not just people with dementia, anybody. And, but it's a difficult thing. You know, your instinct sometimes can be, everybody's different, but someone starts to like, mm, have a different present than you do. And you're like, no, 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 no. The worst thing you can do is tell them, no, 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 that person died 30 years ago. It's like, ah. yeah. then they, you know, it's like, why? Who are you doing that for? You're just freaking yeah. them out. If they tell you they just had lunch with someone that you, you know, know died 30 years ago, say, what'd you have for lunch? And then have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you're not going to have it's you're at your it's you're going with their story. But in that story, as Henry says, I mean, I learned a lot of things from my mother and father that I would have never maybe learned if I hadn't been open. They would he would sort of 
my dad would regress and he would sound like a little kid, you know, and he would be speaking Danish like what he did only when he was a kid. And and he would tell me these stories and I'd check in with his sister, my aunt. She oh yeah, what happened that was during the war and this and that. And I learned something that I never knew. But because I was open to it rather than going, No, what are you talking about? You know? Um my mother too. We just learned these things just by being present and listening rather than trying to make them be how we need them to be so we can be comfortable. Make them comfortable. Um, you know what I mean? in, indeed. Uh, it, there, is, there is a lot of polarization between these characters where, uh, as you said earlier, it gets a little bit difficult to think of somebody's level of tolerance. You know, John has such, mm. uh, and, uh, uh, such an amazing level of tolerance un until he doesn't anymore. Um, right. But there are such families that really do exist like this. And it is not yeah. strange. It's not so uncommon. Um, so you provided a much needed softer tone to how people debate and understand each other and ha share these sharp opinions among the family as compared to, you know, the ugliness of social media, as you mentioned earlier. Um, was, was that deliberate? really to you know and you can both answer well, this please to explore these interpersonal yeah. relationships i um yeah i'll just say something briefly henry i'll try to be brief i'm not good at that but uh yeah i mean it's it wasn't like i was saying in any way well john is a saint or that's how one should aspire to be it's he just makes a choice everybody makes their own decision some people reject it and i go nobody would put up with that or i wouldn't right well fine you know, and, and some of those same people are people that will go see Marvel movies or Lord of the Rings and, you know, people are getting their heads cut off and there's violence and mayhem and they're like celebrating it. And yet when there's real person to person psychological violence, like there is in this movie, verbal violence, they reject it. It's like, why is that not real? Why is that not something to like relate to real life? I don't know. But, but the idea was that this is a choice that a, one person makes and that it's not an easy choice. He's not like better than anyone else. He's just, he, re, it's just a necessity. He finds that at this point, this old man needs help, whether he realizes it or not, or wants to admit it or not. And nobody else is going to be able to, you know, he's not going to allow anyone to help. He might not allow me, but I, I, I've decided I want to do it. It's just a choice this character makes. And he knows he's going to have to, take a lot of crap and listen to horrible things if he wants to help him. Because if he argues, like he presumably has, you get the feeling he has done that in the past throughout his life with his father, and, you know, and to some degree I know this from my own father, when you butt heads and then communication stops for weeks, months, maybe years, mm -hmm. you rebuild again. And then sometimes those people who aren't good at saying sorry or thank you, next time you see him, you get a hug and they act like nothing ever happened. So it's not really talked about. But now it's too late. He needs help now. So I'm going to take a lot of shit if I'm going to help him. And he tries, like you say, for as long as he can. As a narrative thing, story-wise, it's to tr build a particular kind of tension that can be, for some people, just too much. It's like so repetitive and abusive, this language. Eh, who wants to listen to that? But there's a purpose to it where, where this thing tenses. Or let's say it's a bow, and you're pulling that string back and back and back. And either that the wood's going to break or the string's going to break something or your hand's going to rip off something. And it surely, it, it, sure enough, it does happen, you know, and uh, things break and come out and both people, the person who should be, is trying to be most conscious of not doing so ends up saying things he will always regret at this, in this very strong scene. And um, it happens, but that speaks to other aspects. You know, he's on his own caring for this person. It can drive you crazy. When someone has dementia or someone's having trouble like that, you do need to be spelled. You need help from other people, you know. And when he's in California, obviously his, you know, Terry, I mean, Eric, um, John's husband, you know, is there, is supportive, and they kind of work as a team really well. But then when John's alone, it's just like it's a lot to take. It's a lot to take and, and, you know, everybody's human, you know. So it's just, 
I'm, like I said, yes. I'm not trying to say everything that, that happened in the family. I would like people to make up their own mind. You give some pieces of a puzzle, some mm -hmm. questions are put out there, and then people can take part in the storytelling, and it becomes ideally the audience member's story is much or more than mine by the end of it. You know, I don't know. What do you think, Henry, about that? I, I, um, yeah, well, I think with the with social media, the thing is, um, a lot of the times your relationship with someone is only the things you've you've seen them say in, in writing or actually say in video. Whereas when it's uh, a family member or someone you've known for a long time, you have another relationship with them beyond the horrible things you're hearing them say. And so if you want to have the side of the relationship that is positive with them or the things about them that you admire despite what they're saying to you in this moment you have to find a way to um it's tough because you the emotional response you have immediately to that is probably going to be either totally call them out on it nip this in the bud point out how horrible that is and probably make them get really defensive and feel like they're being victimized, even if they're not. And they maybe will yell back at you and never talk about that subject again. Or the other emotional response is maybe to just try and let it go by and change the subject to something you can both agree on that's more positive. And what's really hard to do is to address the thing that they've said in a way that gets them to talk to you about it. And that's, that's something that you can kind of see with the John character, like he's, he's maybe tried to talk about things more in the past. And now there's certain things that he knows that they're not going to make any headway with and that he's just going to get mad. So he tells his dad, we're not talking about that. I'm going to bed. <laughs> like, you know, this, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. If you want to talk about that, you're not doing it here. Um, and I think, yeah, it's interesting because John is a very, I mean, there's, it's autobiographical, but he's a, he's a different kind of guy in, in a lot of ways from you, dad, I think, um, I think he's a little bit more trying to keep a lid on things and keep everything kind of nice. Whereas you, I think are maybe more willing to have the argument to, to get into it, to, to go there than, than he is. Although towards the end, we both with my mother and especially with my dad, I did realize, and that was based on previous experience with other people with dementia, you know, my stepdad and stuff. But with my dad, I did, you know, I did know that, that at a certain point, there's no, there's no there's no need to argue and just find something to talk about. I would constantly take pick up on something he said and try to go there, and maybe we make a story together about that, rather than what's the point of arguing anymore? I mean, it's not what's what's that going to help, you know? Um, but it is, yeah, I am different. I'm less tolerant. Even the boy you see with a duck when he wakes up and the duck is gone. I know that I was angrier than that boy, although he's pretty annoyed too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also uh, in, in terms of John has a, he wants everything to be nice and decent and not embarrassing to anyone in public and like everyone get along and nice button shirt and like, because I think you're more willing to just like let's be open about it. And yeah, let's yeah, not yeah, yeah. sweep it under the rug. Uh, yes, Henry, are you, are you in the and film? That can, that can have good film? and bad points. Uh, yeah, oh. I, I am. Um, and most people don't recognize me from any of the people uh, who know me. Uh, I was, I was looking guess. for you. I, I was looking. I didn't see you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do you have any any guess? Okay, um, I would guess that you might have been. Uh, I know that you weren't hiding under a burqa, so perhaps perhaps you were. Um, perhaps you were one of the people in the uh, uh, in 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 maybe in the in one of the restaurant scenes uh, where we have uh, some very yes. specific. Yeah, were you in one of the restaurant scenes? Yes. But uh, that's sort of more of an Easter egg. I'm in the background of um, the scene in the Thai restaurant, Poom Thai, which is actually the, the server's real name. It's named after him. It's his parents' restaurant that's in great. Santa Monica. Venice, great, California. Great um, that's sort of more of an Easter egg. I'm in a, a scene that doesn't take place in the, the present of the film. Um, 
which I don't know if this <laughs> makes him picture me in a hat. Like really? That way it's yeah, the like... state trooper. The, uh, I don't know you're how much I should say about me. Yeah. Are, are you the trooper? Okay, you're you're the state yeah. trooper who arrived with the news. Yes. Okay. Yes. I didn't recognize you for the life of me. That, <laughs> that's wonderful. Okay. Yeah, you know most what? people don't. <laughs> Henry did a great job. Really great. Beautiful. Really did. Scene. Very yeah, hard to do. Really. It was snowing. It was super it was cold yeah. that day. Wow. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. that's incredible. All right, now let's move on quickly because I want to <laughs> ask you about what we learn from J.R.R. Tolkien about the bonds of family and how important <laughs> family is. And I'm looking directly at, you know, Frodo being an orphan because his mother and father are dead and his uncle mm -hmm. decides to save him from what would probably be the, the equivalent of being, you know, in social services in the Shire. And, and Bilbo adopts his nephew because he's not going to have any children of his own. And, um, and so together it, that type of family bond is the obvious one, but there are so many others. Um, what do you think we've, what is it about Tolkien's voice that brings us to that common understanding of finding strength with each other? Oh, I think there's, well, I mean, obviously, talk... there's... No. no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Oh, there's a lot of stuff about, I mean, uh, royal lines in Tolkien, like in terms of obviously Aragorn's character arc, that's important. Um, but those are kind of background to the main characters the the family that's important to the main characters just like how it's about these like seemingly unimportant or you know past their prime maybe or like oh he's never gonna step up and be king kind of characters banding together and fighting power itself um that it's sort of it's the family you put together in your life like it's you know sam and frodo is probably the closest deepest relationship in in that story of any whether romantic or not and they're not mm -hmm. related by blood or marriage in any way they're just really good they're they're you know they're they're brothers though you i think you really could say that um in their in the bond that they have and the fellowship is is this family that's been created that you know by the end brings a dwarf and an elf together as as brothers almost as, as well the fellowship is what I went to when you were talking about. Yeah, obviously it's, and I, I love that idea. It's the family that you make. That's as important, sometimes more important than the family you were born into. Um, that's how you are in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I think I've always felt it's more important how you are than where you are, you know, and that includes mm -hmm. how you relate to people around you. And I don't know. I mean, I do, as Henry, <laughs> alluded to, I mean, I, I like to sort of be direct most of the time and have things out in the open and I can, and I have a temper, you know, at times, um, most of the time not, but it, it, you know, if I sense injustice and I could be wrong about it, you know, and I often, you know, I can be sometimes, then I get really riled up sometimes and, and sort of come, you know, leaping to the defense of something and sometimes i realize oh no i, I misunderstood that situation <laughs> but that's where it, what really gets to me and and then there's times where it's always important to think before you leap <laughs> to think before you speak i don't always do it i kind of get going but it's it's how you connect to people and how you how you how you listen to them that is so important and you see that in the fellowship, you know, there's, there are all kinds of different people intentionally that the writers put together. In some cases, you talk about elves and dwarves, you know, mm, not likely to get along, and yet they do, you know, they find a way uh, within this uh, gradually, you know, newly formed family. And, and, and I think that's really beautiful. I think it's ironic and sort of disturbing and basically stupid that there have been some extremist right-wing political movements and parties that have used Lord of the Rings imagery. I can name a couple of examples. The Arizona Republican Party, 
use an image from, well, Aragorn, I think, at the Black Gates, about to charge or something like that. Or maybe it was Helm's Deep. I think it was Black Gates. And, um, it, you know, like this fight against the steel, against the, you know, the traitorous Republicans. I don't know. It was just they're using that image to promote their extremist, uh, exclusionary approach to things, philosophy, just ignorance, and the opposite of what the Lord of the Rings was about and what Aragorn was about, a person who was a traveler, who was a person who was all about collaborating with different kinds of people and races and all that. So it was really strange. In Spain, uh, Vox, which is like a neo-fascist party, really, um, anti-immigrant, homophobic, misogynistic, just hideous throwback uh, to, you know, dark times in the 20th century in Spain, really, Franco. Um, they used uh, the, the moment where Aragorn charges, where he says, for Frodo, I mean, that, you know, and then they had all these, in the background, all these symbols, like feminism, communism, you know, like, this is what we were battling, right? And it's just really mm. disturbing. And when, when the opposite is what <laughs> they're really about. Uh, these know, these about people, no, you're, you're, you're right in saying that these people are clueless in understanding Professor Tolkien's attitude. Um, I mean, uh, most of us who are hardcore fans are very familiar with, you know, how upset Tolkien got when the German publisher in the 1930s was demanding proof of his Aryan heritage so that they, so that the Nazi party would approve of a, a German translation mm. of The Hobbit. And when Professor yeah. Tolkien wrote the most amazing letter telling them off <laughs> and saying, you know, you can go hang with that. I, I don't care about you Germans. And I really am not impressed with your pernicious race doctrine. And he went further to explain, I wish I had um, more wonderful and fruitful friendships with the beautiful Jewish people and how artistic and creative they are. I, you know, so he went mm. on and full, fully locked and loaded. Yeah. Tolkien it's shot down letter. that entire mm. yeah. sphere of conversation. And yet today in 2021, people are misappropriating it still, uh, his, his ideas and his themes. You, you are going to be hard pressed to find a stronger statement of multiculturalism and cooperation than in the fellowship itself really true but that's true, just true, one, true. one i mean and also token you know when he was publishing the books people were trying to make say well this is clearly you know a metaphor for an allusion to world war ii the forces and he said no it's not it's not no it's based on something else you can extrapolate exactly. all you want but i didn't i wasn't and i i remember when the two towers came out there was an article uh, it was a review, not new. I think it was in Time Magazine mm. that came out, and it was a positive one of these small reviews that doesn't say a lot, um, which is probably just as well in most reviews because they're so lazy they end up telling you the story rather than offering an opinion <laughs> that's worth anything. But in this case, this was a. I don't know if it was Richard Corliss or somebody, but it was somebody well known and respected and good, you know, critic informed and he in the heat of the moment you know 2002 it's it's um, the lead up to the invasion of iraq you know mm. by by the bush administration and um and all those drums were were sounding and uh, at mm -hmm. that time and he his review of the two towers he said well this is clearly um you know the 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 evil Saruman, bearded Saruman, is a clear, is clearly uh, reflected in our time. You know, it's Osama bin Laden, and that the and then the and then the dark forces attacking. You know, and the he was comparing the the fellowship or the or the people within Helm's Deep defending it as the coalition of the willing, and essentially the orcs outside attacking were the you know the muslim hordes i mean i don't I, i'm paraphrasing but that was the gist of what he was saying and that clearly so reductive. anybody can see that that that, yeah. that christopher lee is 
is uh, reminiscent of that Saruman is, is Osama bin Laden. And I wrote a letter to him, and I you know explained to some degree, or I reminded the guy that you know that Tolkien did not write in that way or think in that way, and that it's also really offensive that you would compare you know our story to that. They they didn't print it. They wrote back and said, oh, we don't have room for your letter. It wasn't almost not that long, so we put it out on the on personal so, press, but. It, but it's just yeah. that that kind of thing, there's always a danger, symbolism. I mean, the way the Trump administration used uh, patriotism or the idea of national identity and, 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 and uh, you know, American mm -hmm. values. I mean, this, uh, you know, even like moral values. I mean, what is, what's that mean? What are you trying to say? You're telling other people that their values are no good is what you're doing when you're talking about moral values, the moral majority, mm -hmm. all this. You know, it's very dangerous yeah. the way language and symbols are used sometimes. I and agree. It's, it's always it's, important to resist, resist it like Tolkien did. And I think no argument like that, no matter how we might agree with it morally, is it any argument like that is reductive for Lord of the Rings, I, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and what Tolkien's trying to do with it because um, there's an independent journalist I like a lot who I think is in Lord of the Rings because he covers extremism. His name's uh, Robert Evans, not the recently passed away producer, different uh, Robert Evans, but he covers extremism in the in the U.S. as well as uh, like Syria and Ukraine and stuff. And he was talking about the same thing about how extreme right wing people sort of latch on. To Lord of the Rings, and there's certain lines about men of the West or whatever that they see as this thing about what we call the West, which is different from the West. And, and Tolkien, obviously, it's not the same geography at all as our world. Um, but and you know, but anyways, but and he was making the point that the villain in in Lord of the Rings isn't the wrong kind of power or power through violence or technology used for the wrong purposes. It's power itself. It's the desire for power. That's it. Like that's the villain. The ring, what it represents and what it offers, whether it's to Boromir or even Aragorn with the Palantir or even Gandalf, like why no one except Frodo can even touch this thing is because even with the best of intentions, power, the desire for power is bad, is the, the point of this right. book. And that's what Sauron represents, immense technological military power, but also the offer of power for people like Saruman even who start with maybe good intentions, that it's power itself is, is the bad thing, that desire for domination and power itself. There's no qualifier to that. That's the villain of the story. Mm -hmm. And the good guys yeah. are this group of misfits that are all like princes, kings who won't accept their thrones, gardener, two drunk cousins, and an orphan. You know, they're Orphans. not... <laughs> yeah. Yeah weird old man who hangs out with hobbits like <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> it's a hodgepodge <laughs> yeah, i agree um, the the spirit spirit who never impresses dad enough and you know but these yeah. are these are your heroes i was thinking about <laughs> Tolkien too what you know that letter that you were talking about that mm. you know he was a very obviously learned person and his sources go a long way back and linguistically, historically, mythology, you know, Nordic mythology, Celtic mythology, uh, history. I mean, his, his sources go way back and have deep roots. And so I think, you know, when you think about it, mid 1950s and those books are coming out and people are making allusions to World War II and the Nazis and all that. And I think he was, probably sensitive about how, in fact, even <laughs> the Nazis had tried to use Nordic mythology. Uh, you know what I mean? Exactly. And, 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 I mean, yeah. I, I imagine that as well. And that, that was a misappropriation as well. And so he was like, I won't have it. I'm not going to have you, you know, mm. pigeonhole me. This is much bigger than me or you. This is human history. Uh, mm. There's much bigger themes and much more... Um, universal theme it's not about one moment in one century one nation one race mm. none of that applies you know what i mean yeah. mm. indeed i agree um, and i i'm just like the professor in that i have no tolerance for that kind of reductive overly simplistic uh uh you know 
trying to kowtow to some kind of political tribalism, which is not healthy. It's not not doing anyone any good. And I don't have any patience for that either. Just just like Tolkien. Um, but let's let's talk about really. I know <laughs> we've got we've got some pictures of you reuniting with the cast, and um, we want to talk about the good old the good old days, the golden memories of working with Peter Jackson. What was some of the singular lessons in directing that you primarily kept with you in working on your first hmm. directing debut? Well, I'm grateful for all the friendships. And, 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 and while I'm also grateful because it helped, you know, gave me many more options, you know, in my career, the fact that the, the, the trilogy, Peter Jackson's adaptation was so wildly successful around the world and you know we're still talking about it and it influences filmmakers and writers and all kinds of people um but the main thing i take from it aside from the real friendships you know is that process of making those movies something that will never be repeated in new zealand or anywhere else in quite that way because at that time Yes, New Zealand had, you know, a film history and there were some, you know, there had been really good directors that had already done things in that country, including Peter Jackson, but also Jeff Murphy, who shot, who was one of the many second unit directors, uh, people lent a hand, Jane Campion. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of people that have come out of New Zealand and there's movies at that point in other places. But basically, Peter Jackson took a crew of hundreds, hundreds of people most of them Kiwis, many of them who had little or in some cases practically no experience. Certainly none of them had experience making a huge, on a huge production like that, which hadn't been done in New Zealand at that time. And many of them had very little film experience. Some had some TV. It was just a mixture. It was kind of like the fellowship, just this hodgepodge. And it was like a very New Zealand mentality. You know, they had this saying, well, You've got a problem situation and you know, well let's fix it with some number eight wire meaning you know this wire like farmer you know whatever's broken you can fix it you know we'll find a way this inventiveness that peter jackson displayed in a collective fashion on a daily basis with this huge team of variously experienced and inexperienced people they saw <laughs> what you have to do in movies any any movie is about overcoming obstacles and problems one after another, no matter how well prepared you are. And they had lots of them, big and small. And every day it was a process of solving that. Well, why can't we do it that way? Well, let's make up a new way of filming something. You know, let's do that. Let's do this. Little things, big things, design, <coughs> design questions, collaborating, you know, thinking outside the box constantly. That was the, that's the thing that was the most valuable to me. It was like a years long, wild and woolly film school uh, ah. that you could, you know, if you chose to, which not many people did really, to just stay in your, you know, your trailer or your dressing room or whatever, um, you might miss some of it, but you couldn't help see a lot of it because while you were on the set, the weather would change or something would break and they had to figure out how to do something else. Um, or we'll come back next year in the spring and do it again. We didn't get it all, you know, whatever. It was a constant inventing and reinventing was going on on a daily basis all the time. It was thrilling. I'd loved, I mean, I just think now, thank God I did, I could have done more, you know, <laughs> but, I wish, but I did a lot. Just run over to the, you know, run across the, the parking lot. Let's go into the building there where, where, um, you know, where John is drawing stuff for Rivendell, where they're making this. We'll go over to Weta and just see what's happening, you know, hang out with so and just watching them build and make things and fix things and reconfigure shots on a daily basis. It was just that picture of that we just saw of Elijah in the snow. That that was that was sort of wild. That was down in the on the South Island and got snowed out. And um, 
Yeah, that was early on, very early on. And we couldn't shoot, but we, it was fun anyway. It was like, you know, and then they figured out, okay, well, Peter Jackson figured out, well, we can go, we can get a shot and we can have snow in it. And they're traveling, it just shows that they're traveling through different terrain and it's cold sometimes. The scene where, mm -hmm. where Strider throws the apple over his shoulder. And, um, and that was, that was beautiful. I mean, when I see these pictures, it's like when you look at a photo album, you're generally seeing 90% or more of what you're seeing is outside the frame because you're remembering mm -hmm. where that was. If you're connected to that picture somehow, if you were there or you took that picture even. Um, and that's true of the movie itself. When I watch Lord of the Rings and I've watched, you know, I prefer to watch the extended versions and I like watching it with, yes, especially thank little you. kids, <laughs> little kids who've never seen it. It's great to watch. I mean, any movie, it's, it's really good to, that you know and maybe and like. It's good to watch it with someone. You'll learn something. It's a different movie each time you watch it with someone new. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and that, every time I watch it, I've watched it, I see or watch them. I see something. I remember things that happened. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember that day. And, and, you know, this happened or so-and-so was sick and then they worked anyway or, or we went fishing afterwards or, you know, just all these, how, what's happening in your life at that time is what you're looking at. Everything that's outside of the frame, you know, but there's, it's a stimulus, you know, uh, to, to watch them and such a varied and rich source of stimulation and inspiration for so many people, you know, that, mm. that had the good fortune like I did of, and Henry did of working there. And Henry, I remember when he first came out to visit and he was put to work, he was working, you know, with Weta, he's working with the costume department. Um, he was, as most, you know, Rings fans know, he played a bunch of different characters as he was growing up, you know. He was, yeah. <laughs> he was a new Minorian. Cool he was a, yeah, and visiting at different times like that, you got to see, because like you were saying, uh, reinventing, they didn't, one, they were coming up with especially in, in terms of art department and effects they were coming up with a lot of and makeup department more than anything new approaches and new technologies and they were very experimental with it where they would figure something out but that wouldn't be the end of it like the first time i visited no, they, they would evolve up, and the urukai outfits were like head to toe thick sort of rubber foam outfits that covered almost everything and the the stunties had almost no vision like zero peripheral vision and so we're doing these falls flipping over their back without being able to really see if they were landing right or not because uh, they had no peripheral vision but then by the time uh and there i was doing yeah i was a young rohan guy and then i i visited for the reshoots for return of the king was the last shooting i saw and there i did some background stunt work as both a gondorian and a, a mordor orc and the they had improved the the prosthetics so much by that point that i mean it was still hot and uncomfortable but it was you could keep it on for a long period of time you could see everything you could move you could full range of motion with your arms you know all the stuff that uh, like so they, they didn't just be like well we got these orc suits those are our orc suits like we'll repaint them no. greenish they're not urukai in this scene like they they would make new stuff constantly which was really amazing the ears the ears kept yeah. improving the hobbit's feet improved and, yeah. which mm. yeah and like you're saying i in, sort of did some interning with i made a bunch of rohiric braided belts or wardrobe wow. i made gondorian bowstrings for the gondorian rangers for uh weta yeah. going into weta was just really cool because even though this is a fantasy world, when it came to the props and the costumes, they tried to root, not just to have like a, a real world cultural group to maybe draw from, um, which wasn't just limited to Europe. They, they did go even for like the sort of core characters. They would go beyond Europe for some, some ideas, especially with the elves. Um, but, you know, even though it's this magical fantasy world, they wanted to make sure things like if it was a sword, or a crossbow, something like that, they wanted to make sure it would actually be practical if it was real. So like this crossbow they actually, know. like they actually came up yeah. with a way to create a reloading, self-cocking crossbow mechanism that actually worked. Things like that, that in a world where magic exists, you would think, you would be like, ah, whatever. 
to spend your discipline. No, it and works. And there's swords. Like long left. And there's uh, armor and to have the right were balanced. not as visible rivets if it didn't like to be fastened in a way that was in keeping with medieval technology, not modern or 19th century armoring technology. Mm. So, I mean, things like mm. that. It was really impressive. And even and though the chain mail was made of plastic for the background actors, they still pieced it together piece by piece the way you, you piece chain mail together. Wild. Wild. And, so, and the sword it, balanced and things were functional um, and sourced possible in something that was historically sound, you know, you know design. And, and yeah, it was really something. I mean, obviously, a lot of movies, not just. That's what the fantasy genre exploded, and see it in all kinds of of movies since Peter Jackson made those movies. You'll see, in some cases, Weta did work on those movies, but but you'll see weapons that are you know the style of weapons. I mean, obviously, uh, obvious examples are what was it? Uh, well, the Game of Thrones, obviously, but before that, even like the what was the movie that Orlando did. Uh, the Crusader movie, Kingdom of Heaven. Oh, uh, Last Kingdom, right? That... Kingdom of Heaven, yes. That's what it's called, yeah. That's what it's called. And I was just looking at the source and some of the things there, the very similar um, influences that they were, were borrowing. They were really borrowing directly from Lord of the Rings and some, I think. But it's interesting mm -hmm. to see that, um, how much Tolkien has inspired, obviously, that without... Tolkien having written those big books in the 1950s, um, bookstores starting in the you know 60s and 70s and until this day, there wouldn't be whole sections of fantasy literature without Tolkien. Really, it wouldn't be such a going concern. You know, someone else had gone and done it, but nobody's done Indeed. it like him. Uh, obviously, you know, um, all the Harry Potter stuff. None of that stuff would. Uh, would exist there's been a lot and likewise in terms of filmmaking mm. visuals and the ways of shooting movies depicting certain kinds of fantasy characters so many movies good and bad mostly bad uh oh uh, uh, great debt to what peter jackson and him came up with you know in the last, last 20 years such i mean all that act that accidental innovation so much innovation and so much of it organic that had to be created, as you've just beautifully described, uh, had to be created mm -hmm. by necessity on the fly for, for you know, day-to-day -day problem solving. It's really amazing. Um, let's, just, let's just go right to the big, the big question that I have on my mind. Now that you have a, had a taste, Vigo, of directing and... Now that Amazon Studios is getting ready to throw down uh, a lot of money producing a new TV series, let's talk about the fact that other actors like Jonathan Frakes from Star Trek made the move to being a wonderful director and directed many episodes and feature films for Trek. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any taste for this now, Vigo, that you might want to step into the you know, or throw your hat in the ring in New Zealand and direct a couple of episodes for the upcoming series. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> oh my God. I, I mean, they, I have just, they started already? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, they yeah of course. Just, they, they just sort of officially announced some things last week. Uh, but isn't yeah. Bayona, the yeah. Spanish director, really doing all of that? Mm -hmm. is, isn't uh, Bayona doing all of it? That is correct. Mr. Uh, J.A. Bayona was directing yeah. just the first two episodes, uh, of, which oh. are technically the pilot. And there's going to be, as yet, uh, an unannounced series of other directors who will mm. come in to do other episodes. Um, why not? Would, <laughs> would you be thrilled at maybe at the idea of guest directing an episode or two? <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> you never know. You never know. They probably have... Uh, more established people in mind, but you never know. I mean, I've just directed one movie. Um, who, knows? who knows? I mean, I have written, you know, in the pandemic, I've written a couple more. I have several screenplays, which I'd be happy ah. to make into the next thing, but I'm open to, I'm certainly always open to suggestions. You never know where the next inspiration or job opportunity mm. that 
he would teach you something would come from. Yeah, I'm curious as to what Fair they're enough. doing there. I, is he? Are they with Weta and all? That, is are they using availing themselves? Uh, the, the news that we hear, the the news that we hear is that they're not using the infrastructure that, and they're only using some artists from Weta. Um, I heard Daniel Falconer had his name tossed around a couple of places, uh, doing some armor designs for them. Um, but no, they're trying to they're trying to make something new, perhaps to break away from the the six films of Middle Earth that exist. But they're also trying to, and we're just hearing a lot of rumors. But we're hearing yeah. that maybe Howard Howard Shore might come back in a limited hmm. capacity to do some themes or some uh, some limited composing and some of the some of the weta people, music supervisors yeah yeah there there are some boots on the ground uh right now that are you know our familiar friends from weta but not not a, a whole mm. lot i think that there's um there's an interesting effort to go and strike something new uh, maybe a new right. tone and a new approach Fair enough. so yeah well, well we're learning very little bits at a time um but uh, i'm i'm fascinated by any performer or uh, who can become a multi-hyphenate, who can take the energy of creativity from in front of the camera to behind it. And you just mentioned that you have mm -hmm. other scripts and other material you've written uh, during our mm -hmm. you know, quarantine year. Um, that's fantastic that you've had so much creative output. Maybe that is the best thing that happened to a lot of artists during the pandemic is that they had a lot of time to sit down and create. Yeah, time to read, time to think about stuff. Also time to connect with people that maybe you've lost touch with, had lost touch with, and even mm -hmm. people that you maybe had, the last time you spoke to them, you didn't get along too well. And then you start to think about the pandemic and you start to think, well, you know, life is fragile. It always was. But the pandemic mm -hmm. kind of reminds you the fact that something that's always been true, that anybody can get sick and die at any moment, no matter how young or old or rich or poor, it doesn't matter where you live. And the pandemic mm -hmm. makes that very clear, right? And so, mm -hmm. so it's like, well, what's, why not? I mean, I got nothing else to do. There's lockdown. I'll call her. I'll call him. I'll write them, you know, and it's like, to try to pick up. They'll respond or they won't. But just the just the impulse to do so following through and doing that writing a postcard a letter or an email some text message whatever you do that's been good i think a lot of people have done that too and everybody's dealt with the confinement in different ways and you know for me it's been good and i'm constantly aware of the fact that i have a roof over my head and you know food covered my health uh, those around me generally, that Henry's fine, even though we haven't been able to see each other for a long time. It's like, those are the things that matter. And also when I, lately, when I sort of, uh, let's say I disagree with someone or it's a political thing, you know, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, mm. you know, our country, society is rife with poor communication and, and uh, hurtful language unnecessarily verbal attacks and just and I, I was thinking one day about this you know next time as an exercise a good thing to do when you're just about to like someone have it physically or verbally or whatever and you feel you're in your rights because it's like what they're saying is outrageous it's not true it's offensive whatever um you can still do that but tone matters and this is the thing I have to remind myself when I get passionate. Tone matters. It's how you mm -hmm. say the thing. If you look at that person, they want to really go at them. And you just do an exercise and think, well, no, I have a secret power. I know that in 10 minutes after I say goodbye to them, they're going to get hit by a truck. Or I know that they have cancer all over their body. They don't know that they're going to find out next week or tomorrow. That might change the way you talk to them. You can still disagree, but you can talk in a more constructive, like not breaking all this kind of way. Like, and I've said it and fuck you and you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
there's another way to say that. Well, I disagree, and Henry, you're quite good at that. I disagree with you because of this and that and that. And, and I mean, even you can get heated sometimes. But yeah, you're I generally to, much better than me I about that. Assume a little too much based on, like, I assume I know the shape of the whole iceberg under the surface based on what someone said sometimes. Because I mean, there's that's the thing today. There's certain, the way the internet has propagated just crazy alternate realities. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes someone says something and it's reminiscent of a certain complex of beliefs that you've heard about on the internet. And so you then say, oh, you think that? That means you think you all think of all these those other things. things. Yeah. And you are, if you think all of that, you are really a piece of work, but really like maybe they only are not quite red pilled or only just starting to be seduced by that world. They've only heard this one thing and it sounded reasonable to them. And you could be the person that stops them from going down that road. But if you right. chew their head if off, you're you're like, these people are right. These liberals are crazy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Okay. Now here's, Here's here's the thing. Before we run out of time, and unfortunately, it seems that we're getting near the end of our time that we have. But I want to say thank you very much for having that moment with Lance and the horse, where the horse comes to just kiss him, um, lick him on the face, and all I, all I could keep thinking was that scene in the Two Towers, <laughs> where you were lying there on the riverbank. And you've got to tell me, yes or no, was that a direct homage to the Lord of the Rings where the horse comes in to kiss Lance on the face and you're like, oh, my gosh. Well, I wasn't necessarily I was. doing that, but, I, but it was something that was obviously familiar. And I remember talking to the, the horse uh, trainer there. Yes. You know, and we didn't have much time to work on it. But... I knew it could be done, I, but I said, believe me, I know it can be done. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, you know it can be done. So well done. It's <laughs> but, but he was great, I have to say, uh, um, Rick Parker. He was, he was, he was great and uh, very helpful, and that was a great experience learning to do that with the horse mm. uh, during Lord of the Rings. It took a, a, quite a while, and just coming over and looking, it was actually down, big, huge animal could crush you lying down boom next to you and then letting you crawl on it and only getting up when you were ready you know uh, mm -hmm. massive animal so that took a lot more time than the other thing but yeah I mean like many other things in the movie to be honest with you I thought about that in the editing room when I was looking at the scene I was thinking you know <laughs> so uh, but I wasn't other than yes, I know it can be done, you know, before we shot it. I, uh, um, yeah. I don't really think that much about it or any film references, you know, although I assume that all my life experience is not just watching movies or being part of telling movie stories uh, come to bear, as they will for any person telling a story. When it comes time to make a movie, it's, it's no matter how little it might seem like a personal story or you know falling is obviously very personal on some level very but it can be some hand me a story about a mongolian family 15th century and so, and i've never been there and i said well here you can direct this movie you know uh, okay and whatever i do with that story no matter how much i research i'm going to be putting my personal signature on it because of how i look at those characters on screen and so forth and yeah, so every you know, there's things like that. In the editing room, I did when the horse comes over to him. I was I did think of that. We didn't imitate the shot or anything, but it was yeah, it was reminiscent. Oh. And but there were many well. things. And there's sometimes people audiences. That's the great thing about it making their own movie. Them making it their own movie. People would say, yeah. "Oh, you obviously you were thinking of I don't know what Tarkovsky's The Mirror or or some other unexpected reference, you know." <sighs> This is clearly an homage to that shot, um, either in one of the movies I've been in or something else. And I was like, no, but yeah, I could see that. Or sometimes I would say, that's crazy. I never thought that. But well, No, no. For, for, for the sake of all the Lord that. of the Rings fans, 
just say yes. Just say yes. I meant that. Yes. For, for Absolutely. Everyone loved I was that. totally. I said you must copy that shot. That's great. No. <laughs> I, I want to say thank you, gentlemen, for your time, um, because now we are all out, and it's just really fantastic. Um, I want to tell the audience that they can find Falling with Viggo Mortensen and the delightful Laura Linney, and of course, Lance Henriksen, and who else? Oh, Henry, you're in this film too. We can find it, and you can watch it. It's And you fooled me, brother. That was very good. You can find the film and download it on Apple iTunes store and on Amazon. And it is an extraordinary meditation on family and forgiveness and the, the bonds, the bonds that bring us together. It's just a gorgeous film. So I want to say really thank you for making it Vigo and uh, look at that. That's yeah, is that one of your... that is... Vaughn in the background. Who's in the background? That's oh, BK who... in the foreground. He was in the foreground. It was early days. That was in. Uh, That's great. That was stuff. down in um, in the South Island, and that was waiting to work. Those were the Hobbit doubles, some of them. Um, Sorry. Love that. I love but that. Thank no, you. Hey. Thank you for what you said, and thank you for for talking about falling and uh, and helping us sort of draw attention to it. I think, like Lord of the Rings, it's about communication, about trying to work things out together somehow, some way, mm -hmm. even in especially when it looks impossible, you know, just as it looked impossible, the odds for the fellowship, um, it looks impossible for the father and son and falling to be able to connect, to have some point of contact or empathy. But somehow, in an unexpected way, they find out in themselves that they, that they are at least capable of it. Indeed. And it is it is great wisdom that we need right now. We need that. I think Falling is a film that we need right now so we can open up our listening a little bit and understand each other better. Um, Henry, Vigo, Mortensen, uh, father and son, um, I am blessed. I am very blessed. And thank you for coming to join us all today. We're going to sign off and tell everybody out there in the interwebs that you can find us again every Tuesday in the afternoon at five o'clock here on Torn Tuesday. And this is the one ring.net signing off. We are forged by the fans and for the fans of J.R.R. Tolkien. And we hope to have both of you come back with us and talk and share anytime that you have a chance in the future. You're most welcome to come again. Thank you, gentlemen. And Thanks until then, thank you. Thank you, guys. Until then, good night and good luck. Yes, Hanon Le Melon. Buenos noches y buena suerte. Gracias.